Oh my gosh, what a pleasure to see all these faces. I love having our alums here. T, it's so nice to see you. Mandy, so many alums from um, the very earliest days all the way up through our most recent class. We love having all of you with us and thank you for carving out the time. Um, I just, as we get started, I also want to just recognize the moment that we're in. This is a really kind of unprecedented time with COVID and a recession and uh, our protests and movements for racial justice in this country. And then on top of that, these nat natural disasters on both sides of the, the country. Um, it's, it's a load right now. And I want to recognize that. And I want to thank you for joining despite that. Um, I want you to know that for me, spending this time with you really lightens my load. I really look forward to this. So welcome to all of you and welcome back. Um, and welcome to our special guest, Paul Madeira. It's such a pleasure to have Paul here and I'm gonna ask him to introduce himself in a minute. Um, my teammate Ronnie and I originally met Paul years ago when he came to support a program that we were establishing for veterans at Stanford. And so it's really wonderful, Paul, to have you back now with Breakline. We're really looking forward to sharing more of your story here tonight. So thanks for joining us and welcome. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, uh, at this stage of my career, I will tell you, I get a lot of a lot more satisfaction out of connecting back with veterans and talking about the tech industry than I do finding my newest deals or going to board meetings. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm sorry I'm not General Mattis. I understand he is a very difficult act to follow. But, uh, but I can tell you maybe a little bit more about tech companies than he's able to. Um, in terms of my background, you know, I grew up maybe like many of you. I. Uh, my father was an Annapolis grad and uh, was a sub commander. So I grew up around Navy bases. I had a grandfather who went to West Point. And so uh, I didn't think either of those were as interesting as flying fast jets. So I figured out the, the highest likelihood of getting into fighter jets was going to the Air Force Academy. So I applied there and I was fortunate to do it in the, in the down years right after the Vietnam War when uh, when the criteria for entry was a little bit easier. And so they took me and I went and I spent my four years there um, and graduated, went on to pilot training, got to fly F-4s. I was one of the last guys flying F-4s, by the way, in active duty before converting to F-16s when they came out and they were brand new. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a terrific experience, but I will tell you the thing that really changed my arc of my career was when I applied for the Thunderbirds and I actually almost made it, but I didn't make it. And I was crushed. I mean, this was, I really wanted to do that. And when they told me that I wasn't going to do it, I got to thinking, what else? So I went off to business school at that point, left the Air Force. My father, the Navy veteran, career Navy guy, could not understand why. But I explained that I had to go check something out. I had that brief window when I didn't have many responsibilities. And so I went off. Stanford fortunately let me in, got my degree, and went to, uh, I went to Wall Street for a few years. And while I've loved every single job I've ever had, the Wall Street one probably ranks down towards the bottom of the way I would stack them up. Because as I would stand at the copy machine at midnight, making books for a, a 25 year old uh, uh, recent grad to go present to the clients the next day. I had to, I was asking myself, you know, when I was leading that 12 ship of airplanes in the red flag exercise, wasn't that a little bit more fun and, and satisfying than standing here at the copy machine? Um, anyway, fast forward, I made it back out to the West Coast, went to work for a small uh, investment bank uh, in San Francisco that was taking a number of tech companies public in the 90s. And I had the chance to uh, not only learn the business at a more base level, but then I got the chance to start Meritech with a couple of colleagues of mine from that investment bank, Montgomery Security. And so we got started 21 years ago, and we have focused on the same strategy all the way up till now. We're in our sixth fund. And that is investing in tech companies that are later stage, 
That means they have 10 million in revenue or more. And they're usually raising their third or fourth round of capital from institutional investors. We do typically sit on the board, follow these companies, advise them, coach them, and then uh, hopefully get them public over, uh, over the next few years. We were celebrating around here today because Snowflake got public last night. That was uh, one that we had a, a nice little stake in. And, um, but uh, as I said at the outset, uh, one of the greatest things I get to do now, though, is to talk to veterans who are interested in tech. Because when I started, back here when we started Meritech, there were no veterans in tech, really. I mean, it was, it was a foreign world to the military. And I mean, just based on the number of people on this call, it is fascinating to me to see how open the industry has become and how well veterans are getting represented at the most interesting companies throughout te uh, technology. Paul, thank you so much for taking us through your background. And Paul and I will cover a range of issues. And as we always do, then we're gonna turn it over to you all and, um, and ask you to co-create this experience with us. So start thinking about your, your questions and offer those to us through the chat function. Um, but I, I wanna kind of go back to the earlier stage of your career, Paul, as an Air Force officer. And as you know, Breakline works with our veterans. We work with our mavens. We're now delighted to um, have established a third track called Breakline Apex. Um, one of the things that I have really loved about working with our veterans is the um, perspective that they bring um, to the tech sector. And part of that perspective is driven by um, this experience of managing pressure and managing intensity and ambiguity. And, um, and I think that that is an especially important strength to have right now, no matter who you are or where you are, to be able to manage pressure um, in this moment is, is just an extraordinary asset to have. Um, and you have talked about that, how as an Air Force officer, you developed a higher tolerance for pressure than is typical. Can you talk about how that, that different sensibility that you bring to the table has helped you as an investor today? Sure. I, um, you know, for many of us who have a military background, we got to face things that are much riskier than sitting in corporate offices and writing on pieces of paper or carrying a laptop around. I see a few smiles out there. Um, and in my case, you know, I had a few incidents in the air where I almost killed myself. I think we all do at some point. Uh, it, one of them was in pilot training where I was turning, you know, you fly this oval pattern as you're practicing in this. And I was turning in to uh, start my final approach to the runway. When I got halfway through the turn, I got to thinking, I just heard another guy calling the radio. He might be underneath me. So I, you're, you're, you're close to solve speed. So you don't have a lot of extra airspeed to play with. I rolled upside down and sure enough, right underneath me was another guy trying to land on the runway at the same time. My fault. Anyway, I pulled up and away. I almost stalled the airplane right there close to the ground. I didn't, and I made it out of there. Another time, I was flying uh, F-4s in the Philippines at an exercise and almost had a mid-air. I mean, literally came within microseconds of, of a 90-degree impact with another airplane at exactly the same low altitude. And I can remember thinking on the ride home, you know, what would they actually find out of our accident other than pieces of metal five inches big? Maybe? Um, Anyway, those things, and I'm sure you all have had similar incidents in your various lines of work, um, have given me the perspective of when I'm sitting in a board meeting and there's a real tense situation, or we're trying to decide if we're going to make the new investment in something we just looked at. You know, it certainly isn't life or death. It certainly isn't going to make a difference if we can actually eat dinner tomorrow. It's, um, those are really small issues. I mean, what's the greatest danger we face today? It's that I'll fall asleep at this desk and poke my eye out while you know, my face is crashing down on my desktop. Um, and, and, and frankly, we as military types have a presence. We have an experience set. And, and your colleagues will notice that in the civilian world over time. And you should take full advantage of it. 
by the way, because you can be, you can be the voice in the room of reason, the voice of thought, the voice of calmness at times when everyone else has a hard time finding that. Yeah, it was an incredible opportunity to role model um, the behavior that we all need to see right now. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so Paul, I wanna shift the conversation a little bit now. And um, you as an investor, you think a lot about how to value a company, how to think about your ownership in a company. And for our breakliners on the line, um, many of whom are negotiating their compensation for the first time, because we focus on the tech sector, the compensation offers that they think about often include equity, which is their ownership in the company. Um, right. So we get this question a lot, you know, how should we think about this and what does it mean for us and what could it mean for our families? And so as an investor, I'd love for you to share some tips regarding how breakliners can evaluate their equity in general and how can they can weigh competing offers particularly when there are different types of ownership stakes in companies, for example, a private company versus a public company. Could you give us a little bit of a primer there? Certainly. Um, I think you said the right ways to differentiate. There's public companies or very late stage private, and then there are earlier startups. And the, the difference in risk and volatility and equity value is significant. Let me start at the top. I think as a mid-level manager to entry-level employee at many of these companies, you A, don't have a lot of negotiating leverage. You get a lot more as you rise up, you're more senior. But uh, if I could counsel you as you start your job, don't think about yourself as having a great ability to negotiate a lot because most companies have a standard package and they have a little bit of variance on that that they're gonna offer to you at, your, at an earlier age. And you don't wanna be the one who's over negotiating that. Now, that being said, if you do have competing offers, and hopefully you do, it is easier to go and say, I really like you, company A, but company B is offering me a certain salary and an equity package, and it would really be helpful if you could match that. Um, so how do you value it, by the way? Public companies are certainly much easier to value. And the reality is there is a trade-off between public companies and the package they offer versus private companies. And that's pretty obvious. Public companies generally pay higher salaries and give you less in terms of equity value, but that equity is pretty easy to value. That, that those options are granted typically at the current market value of that stock that it trades at. And you won't get that many of them. So there's a nice upside, but most of your comp is in cash, uh, wages and bonus. Private companies, the philosophy is different. You will get less in cash and you will get more in terms of equity, but the volatility and the actual value of that equity is a lot harder to determine, which is why you're asking Bethany all these questions. Um, you know, for earlier startups, you know, the value to equity is almost nil, by the way. I mean, I would not put a lot of stock into an earlier, and we'll get back to this because I think it's really important for us as military types to recognize where, we're, where we should start, where we'll get the most traction, where you're gonna learn the most and so forth, but separate topic. But equity at, at earlier startup is so very difficult to value. Um, but if you do value it, recognize this. Investors will invest in a company at, let's just take a random number, $100 million. And the equity for an earlier company will essentially value the company at a steep discount for that. It might be 25 or $30 million. So a third, a fifth, a fourth of, of the value of investors. And that equity if you are one of the few companies that succeed and go public and so forth, can be worth a tremendous amount, lots of upside, but the downside risk is much more significant. So uh, uh, lesson number two, don't focus on the number of shares as much as the percentage of company that you get. To the extent you can figure out 
how many total shares exist with the company, how many options you're getting, you can get a rough sense for the percentage of the company that you're being granted an option. And then you just ask what the company was valued last at, and that should give you a, a rough sense, a rough, a rough basis uh, by which to value them. But going back to the point I made earlier, as a, as a young military person coming out, Startups are typically not interested in you. And if they are, you have to be really careful. You have to be careful for this simple reason. Uh, startups are trying to hire experts in five different categories who have already gone and, and perfected what they need to do. So they're in finance, they're in sales, they're in uh, R&D, they're in marketing. And the fifth category would be well, operations or some such sort of uh, function inside the company. We military types, unless you're one of the few who got really exposed to a lot of finance, we just don't have experience in those categories. And so um, if you go and you are learning on the job, you won't, you'll have a hard time learning on the job at startups. Typically, you will do better if you go to a larger, more established, more mature company to start with. You learn a skill there, and then you look at bringing that skill back to an earlier startup. So I would be really careful about going to a raw startup uh, or an early startup because um, it, it, it is a really risky career move for us military. And Paul, just to clarify, when you say early stage, are you saying you know, two, two entrepreneurs in a, gar a garage? Are you saying seed stage? Are you saying series A, B, C? What does early mean to you? Yeah, I, I think about early as, as even beyond where we invest. So I would say before a series D or E typically, hmm. there is a lot of risk in that company. That risk is coming down as you get to a series D, E typically but it's not gone. So there's still, there's still a lot of uh, stock value risk and there's a lot of career risk for a military person without experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Paul, you keep a low profile online, which is not necessarily true of venture capitalists in general, um, but I wanted to unpack one of your most famous investments, which happened in 2005. And this is when you invested $10 million into Facebook for a 2% stake in the company. Um, so I'd love for you to just sort of walk us through that moment in time and that decision that you made. If you can tell us what that stake is worth today and <laughs> and how that decision maps to your investment thesis in general. Because I think your investment thesis could be really informative for these folks as they consider the next step in their own careers. Certainly. So I love telling this story because a, it, like many venture investments, it, it is certainly, it doesn't work out like you planned or like you thought. And in this case, back in 2005, I'm looking at some of the faces here. You're awfully young. You probably weren't on social media in 2005, were you? No, I don't think so. So, but back in 05, you know what was big? It was MySpace. MySpace was the king of social media, and it was brand new. There was something called Friendster that was mostly focused on Asia, uh, some U.S., and Facebook was just getting started um, out on the East Coast. Uh, back in 04. So we actually thought this will be a really interesting space. So let's go after the big one, which was MySpace. MySpace was based down in Santa Monica. I remember flying down there with one of my other partners and we sat there and we were negotiating to invest into that company at a $200 million or so price tag at the time. And they had by far the, the greatest number of users. They had a crazy interface where you could put music on. It would blast anyone on as soon as they clicked on your page and so forth. I didn't like it very much, but lots of people did. So we negotiated. We were negotiating to invest. When the CEO called me up one day and he said, I'm really sorry. You're not going to be able to invest. We just sold ourselves to Fox Interactive for $500 million. And I was crushed. 
Um, but we learned enough to realize that this social media thing might have some legs. So we went looking around for the next best thing. And sitting here in my office in Palo Alto, um, I happened to come across a newspaper article about a young woman who was going to Berkeley across the bay. And she uh, was talking about this thing called Facebook that had just come to campus. And she was having trouble getting to class because she was spending too much time on Facebook. And I said, that's the kind of thing we want to invest in. So I, uh, I walked two blocks over here to University Avenue, which is where it was located at the time. And uh, made, uh, I, got, I got a friend of mine to, uh, at Excel Partners to introduce me into, uh, into the group there. And um, went up and met the COO, who was a young guy out of Amazon at the time. We talked about company and so forth. We told them we were interested. And that they had less than 10 million in revenue. Almost all their revenue was coming from either credit card ads or it was kids who were advertising for roommates or selling their bikes on the, on the, on the effective electronic easel for college students. And they were only on 30 campuses at the time. And uh, so I said, what price are you looking for? And he said, 500 million which is the price, of course, that MySpace had been acquired for. And I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, this is, this is crazy. I mean, this is, this is an 05. I mean, we're seeing those kind of valuations today, but back then we didn't. We swallowed hard, I hemmed and hawed, went back and talked to my partners, finally told them, okay, we'll do it. So we invested, and that, um, in that round, we invested at the equivalent, of, I had to look this up for this, Hall, by the way, but uh, the equivalent of 28 cents per share. And today, those shares are down a little bit today, I think, but close to, you know, close to 280. It's a thousand times return from that investment. And if we had held it, it would be worth $10 billion today. Uh, now, we've distributed out to our investors over time, uh, but I have held on to my Facebook stock, so I still have quite a bit. May you all be so lucky. This is why I wanted Paul to tell this story. Um, so, Paul, can you talk to us? I mean, what, what an amazing, extraordinary moment. This is the moment that VCs the world over would love to have in their careers. Can you talk to us? I mean, you talked about $10 million at a $500 million valuation. This is crazy. You went back, here's an example of a high pressure situation where you're able to kind of keep your calm. Um, how did this map to your investment thesis? How did you and your partners decide, okay, this sounds absurd in the moment, but we're gonna go for it. How did you know that it was, it was the right call? You know, it, it was just a gut call, to be honest. Hmm. I really didn't know. It, the space was too new. I mean, today we know social media is huge and it is alongside Google taking uh, advertising literally from the analog equivalent of TV and print media and bringing it online. And Facebook and Google are getting the bulk of that advertising, those advertising dollars. But at the time, it, it hadn't really even started. Google was able to capture some advertising, it was doing relatively well, but there was no social media with, with really substantive advertising. So it was, it was really, I'll tell you, I, I thought about if this thing works at these college campuses, which are the brightest and the leaders of the next generation, then it really probably should apply to a larger group over time. So it was, it was a roll of the dice. Um, I've certainly learned that in my career, which is the biggest outcomes later on are really tough to identify early on because there aren't parallels. And if there is a parallel, it's probably not as big or doesn't have as great a, an outcome as might as uh, as one that isn't. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Will you talk to us about so so Facebook was a gut call, and clearly it was the right one. When you're able to evaluate a company, and there is a pattern there. What are you looking for? When do you know? Okay, this is this is the type of company that I want to back. So uh, in, in our business here, the, the ability to look at hundreds or thousands of companies over time 
is a tremendous advantage. There are a lot of people running around the valley here who have money, who are smart, who are capable, and they may even have some introductions into interesting companies, but until one really has a chance to look at a lot of things over time and build up that pattern recognition, that mental map, um, it's a very tough business to do. And, and um, as you can imagine, I get asked this question a lot. I do have a hard time really articulating it very clearly because there is a gut feeling that I get, and I think many of my better investor colleagues get, which is to look at a management team and evaluate the drive, the determination, and the backgrounds, evaluate it against an idea and the competition that they face around them for that idea as a business, to look at their early traction in terms of what is the, what is the growth rate, the uptake, and so forth, and we try and talk to some customers. And and then try to um, project it out for the next several years and think about whether or not that is the right group attacking the right idea, the right place in time with the right value set for their customer base, that it can get very big. And the reality is that out of 10, out of 100 companies that get founded that are interesting and have an opportunity, you know, fewer than five will actually go public. And it's a very, very difficult thing to, uh, to hit with any sort of regularity. So the chances I ever get another Facebook are absolutely nil, even though I would love to. Okay, but you're referring to the fact that with startups, there's a 95% chance of potential failure, 5% <laughs> chance of an epic success. Yes. Yeah. And there are some companies that do okay and they, they get acquired. And, and so, you know, there's some proportion, less than 50, less than 30 out of that 100 that, that have that opportunity. But in those cases, the stock is probably not worth very much, if anything. So another reason why that startup stock just, just doesn't have. Now, we all celebrate the successes and we celebrate the people that are part of those successes, but they are very rare and very few. And you just have to know that as one who is looking at the industry here and trying to decide if you're, if you have a realistic chance of getting a lot of valuable stock from the startup. Mm -hmm. So, but you said you have trouble articulating this, but I heard a pretty clear framework and I just want to paraphrase it back to you. So the folks on the line can take note. You talked about team, idea, competition, traction with customers, and then projections and really being able to smell test those and, and you know, be able to back it up and, and make sure it makes sense. So take note folks as a, as a framework for evaluating possible opportunities for yourself. So Paul, as discussed, we're in a highly unusual macroeconomic environment given the overlapping crises between COVID and the recession. What subsectors within the tech sector are you seeing that are weathering this period particularly well? And as our breakliners consider, you know, where to take their career next, are there subsectors that you would either advise them to take a look at or advise them to avoid? Certainly. Um, you know, one thing I would add to that criteria you listed uh, on the last question, Bethany, is, is, um, is also the background of the company that you're looking at. If it's a private company, um, it's easy to find out which VCs actually put their money into it. And, and more recognizable VCs um, really are a great indicator for you that it's a quality company. The better VCs get first choice of all the good deals, the lesser known, the lesser successful uh, uh, groups get what's left over. So if you see a bunch of recognizable names as backers, that's a good sign for you. Paul, can I just ask a follow-up question here? I thought I saw at one point that the top quartile of VCs drive all the returns. Oh, that's right. May, that's and right. it's probably less than the top quartile. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, so that proves Paul's point, right? Like you want to make sure if you're going to a startup, try to get one that has tier one VCs behind it. Absolutely. Um, Okay, Paul, so thoughts on, you know, areas of the industry that folks should either really pay attention to or, you know, maybe steer clear from. Sure. And let me talk about sectors within a company and then sectors of companies as well. 
Yes. As military types, by the way, you will be looked at as operations, for want of a better term. And operations because you're thought to have experience leading groups and teams under pressure. Uh, tech companies respect that. They think that's valuable. But they don't slot you into sales necessarily, marketing, R&D, and so forth. Um, but I would tell you, many of you could be great salespeople as well, and that may be the most lucrative place to be in any company. The super salesman who makes more than the CEO, and there are many of those, um, is considered exceptionally valuable because that is a very difficult thing to do, and if you do it well, you deserve to get comp for it. And um, you as military types have developed some qualities which are immensely valuable. The first is that you can get along with anybody, and that's, that's the first quality you must have to be a good salesperson. Second, you have to be comfortable and outgoing and project an image of calm, which you have. And so, anyway, I throw that out because while you might get steered to operations, check out sales as well. Now, within sectors of companies, um, these uh, most interesting sectors do vary over time. Um, but right now, the most interesting single sector in the startup world is subscription software. Subscription software is really the third or fourth generation of software now that is sold primarily to businesses. And it offers um, ROI, I mean, true return on investment for every part of a business that is running. So whether it's improving sales, uh, identification of customers, training salespeople, running finances, running the books, running procurement, running um, the way the CEO or the CFO manages the balance sheet and payments and so forth. Anyway, there's a whole string of those things. Um, Snowflake and JFrog are just two of the latest. Those two went public yesterday uh, to great acclaim, as you may know. Um, Snowflake offers storage in the cloud. Uh, and analytics that you can run against that storage at a very low price. And JFrog offers a way to manage your customer base in a more intimate way as well. That is the single most interesting sector. And I would venture to say that more than half of all investing being done by tier one VCs is going into that kind of company right now. Um, what's not interesting? Semiconductors are not interesting. They've largely been consolidated into a few producers. And if there's a new startup in the space, it, it has a, a tough road to help. Um, I would tell you that um, consumer is, is a little bifurcated. Consumer bricks and mortar, that is selling things through shops and hospitality and uh, airlines, as you can imagine in COVID is very difficult. Um, those folks probably aren't hiring anyway, so you don't have to worry. Um, but some consumer ideas have been the biggest outcomes out of the venture-funded world. Think uh, Google is really a consumer company. Facebook is. Uh, Airbnb, Uber. I mean, these companies really are some of the very highest valued venture-backed companies ever. Um, but, but that's a really small slice because there's a lot consumer-oriented companies that get started up. I think COVID is going to change the consumer world a lot. It's a, it's a space to be very careful. Um, healthcare is, we've done a few healthcare investments, so I don't consider myself a you know, particular expert there, but I do have a few thoughts. And that is that that will continue to grow as a percentage of GDP. There will be more and more money invested in that over time. It can be a very interesting place that to work and to uh, find returns for you all. Perfect, thank you, Paul. Really interesting. So I'm gonna ask one more question, then we're gonna turn it over to questions from the audience. And Paul, I'm gonna ask a question which you prompted me to ask, which was, can we talk about interviewing <laughs> and making sure particularly brake liners from our veteran vertical are well prepared um, to represent themselves in this critical moment? I'd love to hear your thoughts here. I know you've done some, um, I know you've done some reflection in this area. Oh, I have, starting from when I was a young business school student trying to figure out how to do it. Um, and it's a really important topic because your future hangs on it. So 
it's worth thinking about, it's worth investing a lot of time and energy into it because you as veterans need to do this. I will tell you, you suck at interviewing. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I haven't interviewed you, but I can tell you, you do. And the reason is very simple. As veterans, it is pounded into you to be a, one of the team, to be one of the group to participate in successes as part of a larger group and never stick out, you don't brag. Um, and, and frankly, when you go off to an interview and you have that mindset, you do terribly. You simply don't sound interesting to your interviewer. They can't remember you at the end of the day if they interviewed several other people and you won't get the job. You just don't have a chance. And the reality is that with a little bit of work, you can actually be a fantastically good interviewer, but it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, you've got to learn to brag. You've got to learn to talk about things that you have done and you contributed to and you made happen. And you all have them. You all have them or you wouldn't be on this call and you wouldn't be in this process. You wouldn't be a break line alum and so forth. So you need to think about what you can brag about. Then you need to spend some real time practice interviewing. You need to go with your with your friends on this call. You need to go with other people you know in, in the commercial world, and you're gonna be embarrassed to ask them, but you gotta do it. And you gotta go, and you gotta practice interviewing, and you gotta practice interviewing, and you gotta practice some more. And at the end of that, you will suppress that discomfort you feel at not bragging enough to come across as a thoughtful, capable leader. What do people wanna hire? They wanna hire people who have a lot of confidence, who, who have a list of accomplishments that they can talk about, some value they can add, and how you're gonna bring that to their company and contribute. And by the way, we're all used to having military commanders who took care of us. You didn't interview for a job. Your commander saw you worked really well. They slotted you off to something new. You never had a brag and so forth. Well, it's different now. They don't know anything about you. They're not talking to you the last person you worked for. And even if they did, that person won't say anything about you because of laws. So you have got to be comfortable interviewing. You got to brag. And um, anyway, that's me. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for that. I appreciate it. And I know that my teammate Lauren Fall is here for all of you breakliners who are in the the practice zone. So we're here for you. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to questions from our audience, and I'll go ahead and ask just so that we don't have any friction with muting and unmuting. Um, so we have a couple of questions, Paul, for you related to the direct listing approach versus the standard roadshow IPO. So Carolyn Ross and Chris Evanson have both um, asked some questions. Carolyn asked hers in relation to um, to Palantir's IPO in particular, but do you have a point of view on this, on the direct listing approach versus um, Roadshow IPO? Um, I do, I don't consider my, myself an expert, but having been a banker and knowing that process from the banking side and then watching it as a board member many times. Um, so, so direct listing, I think, can be a, a great way to go out. You know, Spotify did it. Uh, Google didn't quite do it years ago, but they did something that was a modified option. And uh, there are several others that are thinking about doing it soon. We have a portfolio company who's looking very closely at doing this. The characteristic that's really important to be able to do that successfully, I believe, is that you must be a household name. You've got to be known. You've got to have the broader populace familiar with you and who you are and have a, a good reputation. To the extent you are a software company that's providing value to corporate enterprises and you have a hundred customers who are paying you 500k a year a million dollars a year you are not a household name and if you try it you won't do very well because the ipos do well when there's a clamoring there's an understanding there's an enthusiasm for it and the ipo process while expensive for companies is one that really helps sort of builds your profile, introduces the company to the investment community, and then has those investment bank research analysts follow the company, publish on it, so that everyone can continue to see how well you do. So bottom line is, if you're a high-profile company, and Palantir is one of those, 
with a great name and a good reputation, you, you, you can consider doing. Okay, thank that. you. Thank you, Paul. This next question is from Eric Biggs, and he said, thanks so much for being here with us today. And you mentioned Snowflake's recent IPO. How, as an investor or as an advisor to these companies, do you determine when the right time for a company to go public is in general? And how was it decided for Snowflake? Um, that is an excellent question, and it has changed a lot over 20 years. When I got started in this business 20 years ago, and while I was a banker in the 90s, um, we had companies uh, like NetApp, for example. NetApp got profitable with 40 million in revenue run rate annually. Um, it, that is impossible today. And, and so what has happened is that it takes a lot more investment dollars and a much larger company before you approach break even, before you get close to uh, profitability. So the timeline is extended. The average time now from startup to IPO is 12 years. It used to be three or four years. Um, it also, it looks like most software companies need to be approaching 200 million in annual revenue before you can go public. Now, you know, Snowflake, if you've been reading the press, they're actually significantly above that. And they could have gone earlier, um, but they chose to wait until they actually had brought their new CEO on board. He was firmly in place. He was ready to start telling the story. And that's when they pulled the trigger for Snowflake. Other companies with Snowflake's kind of business could have gone out a year ago, perhaps. Um, one thing I, I will tell you I do worry about is uh, this unicorn idea, which gets a lot of press attention, uh, is something that a lot of private companies aspire to, and they will keep working and working and growing until they get there. One of the dangers they face, I think, is that you have a lot of growth in your early years. Um, when you get to a certain size, your growth just cannot continue at those high rates. And as growth slows, you become less interesting as an IPO candidate. And I worry that we have a number of companies who are slowing now, the private, and it will not be as interesting or possible for them to go public. That's where these SPACs come in. If you're reading about Snowflake IPOs, you're reading about SPACs. And SPACs actually can do a pretty good job of taking those slower growth, bigger companies public and providing some liquidity. Thank you, Paul. And Colin Parker actually has a related question here. And maybe you can first just define what SPAC means. But Colin says, Thanks for being here, Paul. He said, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the state of the SPAC market and more oh. generally retail access to private markets. Great. So SPAC stands for special purpose acquisition something. Um, and and it, is a, it, it, is an, it is a vehicle that you know, was sort of sketchy in the past. SPACs have existed for a long time, they've been legal, but they just haven't really been associated with good companies. They were always, you know, taking companies uh, that were questionable and providing some liquidity. And, and what, it, what it effectively is, it's an IPO of a shell company that raises money and then goes around and looks. They've got a timeline. It's got 24 months. They have to find a company that they're going to merge into. And if they don't do it within 24 months, the spec money gets returned and the whole thing just evaporates. So, that timeline starts as soon as you read that these things went out public. Then they, so they go hunting around, they try to find something where they can, they can essentially acquire a company or, or put an investment into a company, and then that company is instantly public. Now, what they miss out on in this process, of course, is they don't have all those banker analyst uh, uh, researchers following the company and publishing on them. They aren't particularly well known. Even though they are publicly tradable, they aren't very well known, and so there are some issues there, I suspect, in terms of their, uh, their actual liquidity and the amount of stock that was traded, that, that would be tradable. But that's playing out real time for all of us. Uh, I'm sorry, did I cover the full question there, Bethany? Um, so any other thoughts on just the state of the SPAC market in general, or did you cover it? No. Was, was that? No. So, so it's in transition right now. A, a lot of us are watching it to see if it really does become you know, a vehicle that's respectable for good companies to be associated with. And that should play out over the next year, we think. Okay, great. 
Ryan Monocle has a question for you. And he says, um, with whales in the market, such as SoftBank distorting the appropriate value of companies and then some sort of wacky interest rate policies, is there a new framing or mindset that you have developed with regard to investing your capital? Wow, this is a sophisticated group. I told you in advance. I told you. This is that these guys didn't just let leave the base last month. <laughs> I um, so I, I will tell you, nobody's happier than I am to see to see the trouble that the SoftBank Vision Fund has gotten into. And just to put it in proportion, um, SoftBank raised a hundred billion dollars to put to work into primarily venture-backed companies. The venture world only puts out about 50 billion a year, and that's across hundreds of funds that participate in it. So you can imagine this big, huge pot of money shows up and starts investing. And a couple of things have happened over the last 20, uh, 36 months since they got started. The first is that they had to bid up these prices of companies so that those companies would take their money, for one thing. And they would take a lot of their money. And, you know, they made some good investments. They found some companies that were decent and some that were, they got in at the right price. But as near as I can tell, there weren't that many of them. I know of at least uh, a few companies where we had all, everybody in the Valley had looked at them and passed because the company wanted too high a price. And then we read the story that SoftBank invested at a higher price still and wrote a big, huge check into these guys. And so that did not look like it was headed for the right direction. We all know the story of WeWork and how they put so much money into it. They, they had to put a lot of money out and they thought they would you know, just kind of drill that thing into, uh, into really operational success. But as we know, it didn't happen. Um, anyway, they are out of the market now. And so we don't have quite that same pressure. There is pressure in our world, though, and it is in two different forms. One is there's a lot of other investment vehicles that continually start with a lot of money that are trying to get in and they'll pay up. And the second thing is that the, um, the IPO market has been tremendously frothy, despite being COVID, despite a looming recession out there that we can all see coming. The stock market keeps going up because of the, uh, the, the liquidity the Fed is pumping into our economy. And as a result, we have the snowflakes that are priced at tremendously high values. Every single entrepreneur that I talk to over the next six months will, will point out snowflake is what they aspire to be, and therefore they're worth a lot more than they would have been before snowflake. So anyway, we, have, we still have challenges investing at good prices into good people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. And Dan Bellotti has a question for you. He says, when evaluating early stage companies, are there any metrics that you think are underappreciated by most VCs? And in fact, one thing that I heard you say was, you, you mentioned team, but one thing in particular I've heard you say is that you look for people who have a commitment strategy rather than an exit strategy, which is actually different from what a lot of VCs will say. Yes. Um, the reality is that, that you can't plan your exit very well. None of us can, particularly the earlier the company is. What you can plan is how hard you will work and how you will structure the company for the longer term and how well you will hire. And the best companies actually are driven by really dedicated and somewhat crazy entrepreneurs, by the way. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, as smart as he is, he is not a very personable guy. He's just, you've watched his interviews, you've watched him on TV at all. He is, you know, he's just not the kind of guy that likes to sit and hang out very much. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are a little crazy too. I mean, they'll mortgage their house when they shouldn't. They will, they will run up their credit cards to keep their business alive, which most people would look at and say it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but but that dedication is really what it takes to, to, to uh, develop a great company. And then the second thing great entrepreneurs do is they go out and they try and hire people that are smarter and more capable than them. Most of us, 
we'll go out and hire people that we get along with that we know aren't going to be challenging to us and and so forth and guess what those are probably the b kind of management and you really should be hiring a because great companies hire a management and the last thing is you have to be prepared to continually modify your product your approach and look for benchmarks to uh, pursue because if you're going to be great whatever you do initially or even second is not going to be it every one of these great companies that you read about has gone through lots of modification over the years and um, and that was key to getting to where they are mm -hmm. paul you you mentioned hiring and will sheehan has a question here um he says, again, thank you for your time. He says, most venture capitalists are looking for investment banking backgrounds or former entrepreneurs to hire. What do you personally look for in, in your own hiring? We, um, we actually don't hire a lot. And as late stage, we actually have a very select set of criteria we look for. And, and this is probably not the answer you want, but uh, so I'll spell it out for you. Um, the, the, I, I, as a military guy, slept through a very narrow window back in 99 uh, that, that opened up and then slammed shut, really. Um, uh, 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 most VCs, and I, and I, actually, I actually went and, and studied this anecdotally because I get asked about it all the time. Most VCs, at least a few years ago, had you know, a, a modal distribution of experience in startup companies, essentially. And the most common was the head of market. Um, that's different today. Uh, VCs come from a, a wider variety of backgrounds. We at Meritech, because we're looking for companies that are up and going already, as opposed to the raw startup, we tend to want to hire someone who has some investing experience and has been exposed to a, a brand name investor in, in recent years. So the last few hires we have made were, um, uh, uh, most recent was a young fellow who came out of Spark Capital. So he'd been a younger guy at Spark Capital and uh, he was ready for the next level. Uh, the associate we hired recently came out of Allen and Company. So he was an investment banking background. We hired a young woman, Amy Hay. She came out of Catalyst Partners. That also is investment banking, M&A background. Um, but they are, they are at the lower level. The higher level, um, we're gonna look for someone who has investment experience at least one, if not two places and a track record and a great way of explaining exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. Paul, thank you so much. Um, T. Takapu has a question for you. She says, when investing in companies, do you look for diversity across your portfolio to include minority or women owned companies? As a VC, how do you view social entrepreneurship? And I'll just encourage you all to actually go to the Meritech website. If you, if you Google it and try to go to their homepage, you'll see a pretty powerful statement in support of racial and social justice in this country before you can even learn more about the firm. So we'd love to hear your thoughts here, Paul. Thanks, we're, um, we're very sensitive to that. Because as an industry, it has gotten tremendous publicity. And frankly, that publicity has driven awareness that many of us just weren't that sensitive to years ago. And the reality is everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves an opportunity. And we can help pursue that. Now, we have to balance that, by the way, against what our limited partners will invest in us for. And our limited partners, um, as we know in this industry, will drop you in a minute if you're not producing returns for them. It is cash on cash, and that's all that matters. They do not view us as, as uh, uh, evaluating, they don't evaluate us on any other criteria than that. Now, that being said, we still care about it. So we actually, I'll tell you, the partners at Meritech um, have started our own fund. Uh, I didn't even know you were gonna ask me this, Bethany, but we recently started our own fund and we are personally uh, investing now in underrepresented groups who, uh, who have earlier stage ideas than Meritech would typically consider um, to both provide some mentorship and some capital and to see what, uh, and to see if we can contribute in that way. T, 
thinking about lab rascals down the road. Um, okay, Paul, we might be able to squeeze in one or two more questions here. We have one from Josh and he was kind of piggybacking on the comments around crazy entrepreneurs. He said, do you have any thoughts on the roller coaster ride with Nicola and founder Trevor Milton over the last month? Have you been following that? No. no. Okay. Okay. Um, so another question from Josh Par Parker Barker related to T's question. He said, Goldman recently published data showing female led funds outperformed male led teams. What are your thoughts around ESG investing and any correlation with investing in those social, environmental, social, or governance responsibi responsibility funds or companies? Um, I will tell you, I, I am not an expert in understanding the returns on those groups. I have known an earlier generation that focused on other kinds of social investing. Those, those actually did not do as well as pure return driven investing. Um, but I just can't comment. I, I've seen some of the Goldman data, but I just don't have personal knowledge of that. I will tell you, um, we have several uh, female CEOs across our portfolio, um, of which we're quite proud and uh, spend a little extra time mentoring and coaching because we think it's hard enough to be an entrepreneur. It's doubly hard to be a female entrepreneur. And if you're from an underrepresented group, it is particularly difficult to uh, get uh, attention from those in the investment community. And we want to do our part. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. What a treat to spend the last hour with you. We also love seeing our Breakline community. Such a treat for us to spend this, this um, evening with you as well. We're going to send you a one question survey as we always do. So help us get better at, um, at our work here. Paul, many, many thanks for carving out the time to be with us tonight. It is a pleasure, Breakliners. I, I will tell you, um, I'm not surprised that Bethany and team were behind this fantastic organization. It's a tremendous honor to be able to be here with you today. I wish you sincerely the best. I hope if we see each other around the Valley here, you'll let me know you're a part of this group. I'd love to get to know you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Thank you.